And so the, I, what I'm illustrating now, though, is a si sort of the further extension of this sort of organizational brilliance that the group has shown, because they're reaching out across their, outside of their own you know, savings and housing group to interact with the unemployed youth. The householders will give the youth their compost and thereby just, you know, get clean, not have to throw it on the street. These youth also um, are paid small amounts to take away this compost. And they take other things from the river, so they're trying to clean up the river. And they take the recycles to the recycling places and get a few cents. And they take the compost to a small farm outside the city where some people are sharing land um, with a, a it's both squatting and uh, cases of squatting on public land and also sharing land with large landowners who say, sure, you can use this corner. Putting that soil and, and organic material back, uh, I mean the uh, compost and organic material back into the soil to create a garden, to grow food, to send back to that slum, to that village, um, em employ uh, or provide materials with which some young people will chop up the greens and sell them in a bag to the harried housewife who has no time to cook, or the chapati, or the banana, or the tomato, s providing small, small empl employment for people. And then that food stuff goes back, all organic, of course, not pesticide. They're rehabilitating their own urban space and showing how the soil in rural areas can be kept uh, fertile. It's something Marx recognized long ago that the, the rural areas were being sucked, the, the food as, as people were alienated and dispossessed, thrown to the city, the food had to follow them, and all the compost and waste stayed in the city or in some garbage dumps, and the land was destroyed. This is still a, a problem with organic agriculture today, even though it's better than industrial agriculture, they're still facing the problem of falling soil fertility. And I'm suggesting, like in the case of my other kind of comparative case, is the Grand River uh, Delta, which is where I live in Canada, and up and down that river are people, of course, you know, I belong to an organic uh, farm cooperative of CSA, I get my box of vegetables, there's a lot of organic farming in the area. There's also very many indigenous communities and settler communities are along that river who are facing various forms of uh, in, you know, industrial attack from the world, the, the North America's largest quarry, aggregate quarry, to a garbage dump on top of the, the water aquifer that supplies the entire river system, to housing developments, business parks, casinos, more aggregates, um, so that up and down this river shed, the settlers and, and indigenous people are coming together to, to, to sort of have a bird's eye view of their their communities and come together to try to help each other stop these, these industrial projects. And the lesson that I take from the Haruma case is exactly this notion of working actually not just the, the, the eater who gets her food from the organic farmer, but somehow is actually integrated into uh, a system whereby my compost goes back to that farmer. Um, and somehow some of these other points, these very creative ways of providing, uh, building community, um, cleaning up the environment. They've, they've reduced almost to nothing the incidence of violence against women in their slum in Nairobi because of their sense of community and their sense of sharing and caring. And that actually takes me to the obstacles that I see for any sort of movement either on, you know, uh, to, to bring the new world into being and, and in fact, Arundhati Roy said some time ago that the new world has already been born. It was probably born on the street in Seattle 10 years ago. The new world is here. And this little example I gave you in Haruma is one indication. This, this thing in Haruma couldn't have happened 20 years ago. And it, it's globalization from above that, 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 that crushed people so much that they started to say, forget looking for a solution. We have to just do it ourselves. We have to make the new world. So they started doing it. And I, we can see it all around us as well. But I think that the obstacles to, to realizing this emergence more fully is, first of all, the militarization of the enclosure process, because the enclosures are still going on, and they're getting more and more militarized. So that's the first huge 
thing to deal with, and I, uh, my take, my, and the next, really, the next two obstacles, I think will explain my take. We need to keep, uh, we need to win the fight for fertility. And I mean a lot of things by fertility, the soil fertility being one so that we have food. And, but fertility in the broadest sense, the ability to produce, to reproduce. Um, and sexism is the great divide that keeps this fertility question largely in the control of, of capital. What I mean is organizational unity is impossible. It's impossible for us to win the right for food sovereignty, for energy sovereignty, for sovereignty over our own persons without overcoming sexism. And when I, I don't speak narrowly of sexism about male domination of women. I mean sexism in the total sense of the denial of anything but heterosexual procreative sex. So that any other expression of humanity, it's, sexism really should be heterosexism because it's not only against women, it's against the whole expression of humanity. And thereby heterosexism, homophobia, is a speciesism. It's against the entire human species. Homosexuality is everywhere in all human cultures always has been and always will be. In some places in the world, it's accepted, it's celebrated. And we know if it happens one place in, hu in human cultures, then it can happen anywhere. It gives me hope that we can win out over the, the politicization of homophobia, which is really a red herring. It's another way that homophobia is speciesism because it diverts our attention to the dramas of you know, the indignation of voters behind homophobia, throwing the indignation of voters behind homophobia all over the world. I'm not just talking about the states. Mm -hmm. I'll end with the last thought that, that uh, response to the obstacles. C.L.R. James, in the, at the, after the sixth Pan-African Congress in Tanzania, had a call to the seventh Pan-African Congress, and he laid out three principles of unity speaking particularly to the 7th Pan-African Congress, but I think it applies to the eco-socialist moment today. That is that, that we need to organize at the grassroots level, not at the elites, at the level of elites. We need to look at what the, uh, the grassroots people are demanding and the futures that they're already building. Second, that we, we can't work on a national level. We, we need to think continentally and globally. And finally, quoting the Caribbean uh, writer George Lamming, women are a future that men must learn. Okay, thank you, William.